Well, howdy there, Internet people. It's Bo again, and welcome to The Roads with Bo. Today, we are going to talk about the roads to planetary defense, and we're going to do this because NASA conducted a simulation, and a lot of the reporting that has gone out about it has been, well, let's just call it less than accurate, in a whole bunch of different ways. The simulation had to do with trying to stop an asteroid from hitting the Earth. There is no asteroid. It's a simulation. Let's start with that because some of the headlines were a little misleading on that. Um, and we'll talk about what they found out, what they learned, how they went about it, and just kind of clear up some of the reporting. It's a Lego thing. Uh, okay, so NASA conducted an exercise called the Planetary Defense Interagency Tabletop Exercise. It's a mouthful. The exercise was conducted at Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory. Almost 100 experts from more than two dozen different government entities uh, participated in this scenario. NASA was there, state, FEMA, along with, uh, along with some international participants as well. So, what was the scenario? On July 12th, 2038, an asteroid has a 72% chance of hitting Earth. So that provided them with a 14-year lead time before the anticipated impact. In the simulation, there's no asteroid. The scenario was designed to be incredibly realistic, meaning difficult, with a whole lot of uncertainty. Um especially when it comes to the opening information that they were given. The timeline said the participants would get no new ground observations for seven months. The asteroid was most likely 100 to 320 meters, but could be anywhere from 60 to 800 meters. For context, in 1908, a 50-meter asteroid flattened around 80 million trees, over 830 square miles in uh, Siberia. So the scenario provided, it wasn't exactly a planet killer, but it would absolutely devastate a region or a whole country. Um, I'll put a link down below to like, it's like a map. It's a lot like the thing I gave y'all concerning the nuclear weapons that allows you to, you know, plug in the size of an asteroid, where it would hit, its speed, density, all of that, and see the effects of it. Um, now, in the scenario, they even gave them a potential strike path, and it included some areas that were more or less uninhabited, and some areas that were incredibly populated. Uh, the scenario itself used information from the DART test, the uh, double asteroid redirect thing. Uh, now, from the very start of this scenario, the participants developed different options for addressing it. The first was to wait seven months for more observations from the ground. The next was to send a spacecraft to fly by the asteroid. That would have cost somewhere between 200 and 400 million dollars. The other option was to send a spacecraft to rendezvous with it. This cost closer to a billion. Even though you're talking about something that would have devastated a region, in the scenario, the participants expressed a massive concern over whether or not they would be able to get funding for it. Welcome to America. Um, the general idea was that governments weren't going to want to spend the money until they knew what the risk was. The problem was, by the time you knew what the risk was, you'd already burnt a whole lot of the time that you had to, to stop it. Uh, the time crunch became evident immediately. One of the quotes from it is, 
examining how long it takes to pull a mission together, the flight time it takes to get to the asteroid, and the launch windows that are available to get to the asteroid, that eats up a decade of time pretty fast. So it was, uh, it was concerning that one of the main concerns was that governments themselves would not be interested in attempting to mitigate it. Now, some of the key failures, and we'll get to why, why this isn't a bad thing um, here in a minute, but they noted that the decision-making process and risk tolerance was not really well understood. There was limited readiness to quickly implement needed missions. The global coordination of messaging was not up to par, and as far as like FEMA is concerned, asteroid impact disaster management plans are not exactly well defined. So there's a lot of uh, room for improvement on this. Okay, so you've probably seen the headlines, if you have looked into this at all, that cast this whole exercise as a failure. That's not how these exercises work. Learning that everything is messed up is the point. The list of key failures, the key gaps, all of that stuff, that's what you're supposed to find out. Um, I mean, do you want to learn it now or when there's an asteroid barreling towards Earth? Uh, there's a lot of government agencies and entities out there that will tailor exercises to their capabilities, meaning they'll create exercises they know they're going to win because it looks good. The problem with that is that it doesn't it doesn't push them. So if they encounter something that they haven't scripted, it doesn't go well in the real world. You want the exercises, you want the people to fail, basically, because they learn more that way. That's the reason you do this. Um, now, it's worth noting that this is the fifth exercise or so along these lines. Uh, the previous one was one with very limited warning um, before the asteroid hit. To my knowledge, this is the first time they've discussed what they learned and, and put it all out in the public. And after the reception, it, it'll probably be the last. Um, there's a, I think they're calling it a quick look, and I'll put the link down there for that as well. But there's a fuller ac uh, after action report that's going to be released this summer along with the improvement plan. Again, why these exercises are conducted. Um, but some quick notes out of what they learned. The process for making decisions about space, space missions in an asteroid threat scenario remains unclear. The process has not been adequately defined in the U.S. or internationally. The role of the UN-endorsed Space Mission Planning and Advisory Group in Asteroid Impact Threat Scenario is not fully understood. Sustaining the space mission, disaster preparedness, and communication efforts across a 14-year timeline would be challenging due to budget cycles, changes in political leadership, personnel, and ever-changing world events. Um, there were also some key takeaways about dealing with communication overall and the inevitable misinformation that would come along with something like this. Um, you know, as far as I'm concerned, you know, I, I've got a wild idea. Why don't we go ahead and build a couple of each type of spacecraft that would be, you know, useful in this scenario and have them ready to go? I mean, Realistically, you would be talking about four or five billion dollars. What's a carrier cost? And this is something that would defend an entire region. And you don't really have time to play catch up here. It's a, a massive natural disaster that we actually have the technology to stop if we were to get on the ball. Now, <clears throat> on a... 
completely unrelated note, but kind of related. When we talk about budgets and we talk about spending, and it gets to NASA, there's a lot of times when people basically ask, why are we wasting the money on it? I mean, I would suggest, you know, preventing a region or country from being destroyed is, is a good use of funding. But beyond that, most people need some self-interest. So I'm going to give you a quick list of a few things that NASA helped give the world. Uh, your cell phone camera. Your cell phone camera. Uh, I want to say it's even this far out, I want to say 36% or something, uh, contained tech that was developed by NASA when they needed small cameras that were scientific grade for spacecraft. Uh, if you've ever driven on concrete that was grooved to help reduce water, to stop hydroplaning, that's also because NASA wanted to protect the space shuttle. Scratch-resistant lenses on your glasses, thank NASA. NASA had a bunch of uh, requirements when it came to digital imagery. That kind of led to uh, the CAT scan. The mouse on your computer was because NASA wanted to better interact with data. Those foil blankets you see after disasters, NASA. High-end prosthetics, most of them contain tech as far as the uh, kind of absorbing shock. Um, baby formula has its roots in NASA wanting food for long-term space travel. And this list goes on and on and on. If you want advancement, you have to pursue difficult goals. The future of humanity is simple. You have a choice. You have Star Trek or Mad Max. Those are your options. We can explore the heavens or we can stay here and kill each other over books written about heaven. We have to make a choice at some point. So, I hope that clears up the simulation. I hope people are no longer concerned that there actually is an asteroid barreling towards Earth and understand that the, the doom and gloom as far as it failing and them having all of these things that they didn't really have right that's good. That's good, actually, because they're learning it now. Um, so there's a little more information, a little more context, and having the right information will make all the difference. Y'all have a good day.